Good morning uh, and welcome to the new breed of business. <clears throat> we are having our weekly discussions, which you are welcome to join. If you email uh, us at info at newbreed.co, you can be added to this list and uh, come and join in the discussion. And today's discussion and topic is about what is God saying to the churches about ancient Egypt and some of the parallels scripturally we can uh, understand what God is speaking to his people about. And as with any analogy out of the Bible, uh, whether it's an analogy to, to ancient Israel or an analogy to Babylon or any of the various times and seasons and characters in the Bible, we hold these things loosely. We see them as uh, helpful in terms of um, a metaphor, helpful in terms of even a prophetic pathway that uh, can be repeated in a different way. In, throughout the Bible, there are prophetic types and shadows of what's to come. We see things that were prophesied in the Old Testament that had an Old Testament fulfillment, had a first coming of Jesus fulfillment, and will have a fulfillment to come. Um, some of those are in Zechariah, for example, or <clears throat> some of those are in um, what Isaiah spoke of. And so, uh, today, I'm going to share a little bit of my journey and testimony as a helpful starting point to launch us into a discussion of what do you feel the Lord is saying along these lines, and how can we listen and understand and move out into what God wants us to move it out into. And I guess I'll start with this, that Egypt in the Bible represents many things, but ancient Egypt was the most powerful civilization in the world. And that's where we start today, because many of us are from America on this discussion, but it's a global call. And America has influenced, especially post-World War II, the whole world. And we, in many ways, have been described as the only superpower, for at least for a period of time, um, after the fall of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, now we're challenged geopolitically by China. But in all of that, um, <clears throat> We, 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 we want to understand this. Back in Egypt, in the Bible, Egypt was often represented as the place man would go for provision, for strength in military alliances, for technology. So the ancient Egyptians were very advanced. They had all the math. They had the technology. They could build things uh, that others could not. Um, and... Even what started off as good in the days of Joseph, 400 years later, which was prophesied to Abraham, we saw an increasing corruption, a corruption of what? Worshiping false gods. So the Bible speaks of this as there was a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. And that's where we start off with. They, they, there was a separation from the principles of God that Joseph shared and helped govern and administer in Egypt. And then he was forgotten about. And what we see, what we saw happening was more and more so the people of Israel were enslaved over that period of time. And Pharaoh became more and more prideful, every Pharaoh that went on and more was considered a god and worshiped these pagan gods, including the golden calf, Ra, the sun god, a, a, a whole panoply of gods. And of course, this is an abomination in God's sight, right? So what we see is this separation that God is calling his people into away from those practices. Uh, and then that led to the, the freeing of those slaves. But it really got intense before there was a freedom, before there was Moses raised up as a deliverer, taking God's people across the Red Sea. And we know the great and mighty, miraculous stories of that. Before that, there was a time where the, it was so intensified against Israel, people of God, that they were making bricks without straw because they were being forced into labor that was harder and harder to live and to be to have any kind of freedom at all. So Egypt is this prophetic analogy biblically of where man trusts in himself. And I put in the write-up the scripture that's out of Ezekiel which is the judgment against Egypt, biblically declared by Ezekiel from God. And what is spoken of there is that this attitude of 
I have made the Nile. The Nile is mine. Every good thing that comes out of the Nile, I created. I am God. I'm responsible for it. That was Pharaoh's attitude. He had this impression that there is no greater God other than me and the gods we worship. And I am responsible for all of this greatness. I'm responsible for all of this bounty. I'm responsible for all this prosperity. And it's, a, it's like a self-worship. <clears throat> and it's also like a depending on your own strength type of idea. So one of the analogies here to what's going on in the U.S. today is we have, we have kind of adopted in many ways when we kick God out and say, uh, God, you, we no longer need you in business. We no longer need you in government. We no longer need you in media. We no longer need you in all these affairs. Why do we not need you? Because we can do this ourselves. We've, we've got this. We're great. We can do anything we'd like. And that's like Pharaoh was acting in the Bible. Um, so <clears throat> um, anyway, to, to put it into the context of my journey chronologically, I came out of um, a career on Wall Street, which was a desire uh, in my heart as, as a Christian, as a believer even, to just be in the center of the nexus of commerce and activity and where capital is formed. And I looked on that as just completely innocent, neutral. It's just like plumbing and infrastructure. No problem here. Um, people can participate in this system freely and they can bring whatever heart they have, uh, but that's, that's all that's there. And so as God was revealing more and more of how he was taking me out of that construct, taking me out of Babylon, as I understood it later, you could also say he was taking me out of Egypt. It's like saying the same thing. Why is Egypt interesting? Because during the time of the financial crisis, God had already started speaking to my heart about the storehouse vision, an alternative banking and, and investing process that would be honoring of God rather than operating in the sins of fear and greed. But I didn't understand like what was wrong with the current system. And when the financial crisis came, it started to make more and more sense. And one of the things that I felt the Lord say in the midst of that financial crisis, which by the way, could have tipped into complete Armageddon. It could have tipped it, meaning it could have tipped into chaos. It could, you know, if the banking system and financial system had failed, not only would that greatly affect the U.S., it would affect the whole world. And it did affect the whole world, but it could have been much worse, but for the mercy and grace of God. And so when, when, when I was uh, hearing this, I, and I wrote this in the email as well, I felt like what God was saying is like, Greg, the financial systems are under judgment because they are not honoring of me and they're trafficking, the, in, trafficking in uh, great sins. And it's likened to where I'm judging, is, uh, sorry, Egypt in the Bible. So God was showing me the global financial markets led by the U.S. were likened to Pharaoh and his pride and self-made Pharaoh, self-made man, we can do whatever we want. Uh, we're all powerful. We're all mighty kind of thing that the markets were sort of uh, likened to that. And those who participated and trusted in them were like trusting in Egypt, which is like trusting in the strength of men. And again, throughout the Bible where Israel was warned, don't trust in Egypt don't make alliances with Egypt, was Judah was told, uh, because it will, it will not work, it will fail. Um, Israel, sorry, Egypt was described biblically in another scripture I put in the write-up <clears throat> as trusting, God saying, you're trusting in this broken reed, and you're leaning on this broken reed of Egypt, meaning it's not very stable, strong, it's going to splinter, it's going to hurt you. So what God was saying is, don't trust in that, trust in me. And so back to this financial market analogy, I felt like what the Lord was saying through Ezekiel 29 through 32, which is known scripturally as the seven full judgment of Egypt, um, that God was saying, like that, I am judging the global financial markets. And these, this, this judgment is coming in waves. And these waves, this, is, this financial crisis of 2008 is not the <clears throat> beginning, sorry, it's not the end of this judgment. It's actually early days, and there will be multiple waves of this as time goes on. 
And what I didn't understand at the time was like, why was God saying that? To prepare his people so that as these things are shaken, his people are not shaken. And it, that is a beginning with a spiritual trust where we trust in God and he can provide things even if the banking system failed, if we believe in him, if we trust in him. We also can come together as a community though and enter into the business practices and the investment practices that he uh, said in his word that we should follow. And that's sort of this new idea, this storehouse vision of, wait a second, we're trafficking in a lot of things that God hates. He hates the exploitation of the poor. He hates um, greed. He hates uh, fear of uh, for our financial self or any fear for our own lives. Jesus spoke to us and said, hey, um, come follow me. And those who truly trust in me will do so even if it means their own life. Even if it really means the end of our own uh, life, because we're willing to, just like the apostles, we're willing to give up their life for the name of God, for the glory of God, for the purposes of God. This is a concept that biblically even known as martyr done. Um, <clears throat> but as, 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 as worshipers of Jesus, we should fear nothing but the living God, and we should trust in him always. When we don't do that, we're likened to Pharaoh or the people of Egypt. And when we sort of trust in ourselves, trust in our money, trust in our bank accounts, trust in our military, trust in our natural strength. So Egypt, in a lot of ways, has this uh, natural strength uh, prophetic parallel. And God is uh, showing his people, trust in me, don't trust in Egypt. Um I have a lot more to share, but what I want to do now is actually open this up a little bit. So once that analogy I felt like the Lord was speaking of is like, okay, what you're saying, Lord, is these systems are not innocent. They're actually now becoming traps of enslavement to God's people. And this is like when God's people were trapped and enslaved in, in Egypt. And God wants to free his people. And so if we gain an understanding and, and, we, and we, we understand this idea of leaving Egypt, coming out of Babylon, entering into a bride, making herself ready, prepared, spotless, without, without a wrinkle. What we're doing is we're saying we're not going to align with or partner with any longer a system that's become a haunt for jackals and demons, which is this analogy of Babylon or Egypt. Um, so that's our discussion today. These things are helpful to talk about. Uh, one of the helpful constructs that I have found is Jonathan Kahn's writings. And in there, we see this analogy to Israel, the people of God and the USA, the analogy to Egypt and Jehu and the golden calf. And we're going to get into that in a little bit because the golden calf is like worship of prosperity, money, gold, silver um, of ancient Egypt. <clears throat> um, and we see this parallel of Babylon and other worldly uh, ways of operating. Uh, and God is saying to his people, come out of Babylon unless we will be judged for Babylon's sin and be plagued by her plagues. And this is, this is just like the people of Israel had to come out of Egypt when those plagues were happening. So uh, I'm going to open up the floor now to any questions people might have about what I'm talking about or what, what was this experience you had and why, or share your own analogies uh, where you feel like God has been saying this. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the other scriptures before for doing that that uh, comes to heart and mind is where um, in the New Testament, and I, we could look up the scripture, um, where Jesus was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem, was described as likened to Sodom and Egypt. Does anybody remember that scripture? And this is, again, the same kind of idea and parallel to what we're discussing today. What is it about the practices of these old nations that got hated and why? And why is God asking us to come out of it and those behaviors and separate? So if anybody wants to ask a question or contribute, just put up your hand, unmute, um, go ahead and share your thoughts. Uh, 
I, um, I just wanted to share with you, um, since you brought up 2008, you know, when the financial crisis hit, um, a prophetic act I did that I didn't even realize that I was doing, but I was attending the Ishikar school um, with Chuck Pierce. I was doing it online and well, and um, we had to take these scripture stakes and place them in the ground uh, at certain places. And we had to pray about it first and we had to, and the Lord had led me to a specific date and a specific time and a specific area to go plant these stakes with the scriptures on them. And I went to Grant, of all places, Greenwich Capital. And I went uh, to Greenwich Capital and to the park, the children's park, um, quite close by there, because I used to work near there. And um, I started to put these stakes, I was trying to put the stakes in the ground at, at Greenwich Capital, but the ground was so hard. It was so hard. I couldn't get these these stakes in. I think I ma managed to get one in. And as soon as I did that, there was these people coming out of Greenwich Capital. All so many of them, they were out all over the, the, I never saw it before like that, but they were smoking cigarettes and they were going crazy and they were, you know, at, you know, like on the phones, you know, wringing their hair. I didn't know what was going on. So Lord said, leave here and go to the children's park and plant the rest of the scripture stakes there. So I left and I went and I placed all the scripture stakes by the swings, by the, you know, <clears throat> by where the children play. And the Lord said to me, sit on this rock and pray for the next generation, pray for the children. That's and that was the day the financial... That was the day that the financial crisis hit. I had no idea at that point when I was putting these scriptures in the ground that the reason these people were coming out of Greenwich Capital was because the market had crashed and they were freaking out. And the ground was so hard I couldn't get the stakes in there. And um, I ended up going to the children's park and just praying over the next generation of the children in Greenwich because... Um, that's what the Lord led me to do. And then when I went home, I found out that this had happened. And I was like, oh, no wonder they were going crazy out. <laughs> I had no idea. But yes. I just share that with you. Thank you for sharing that, Susan, because Greenwich in a lot of ways is actually the heart of where hedge funds uh, reside. <clears throat> and if you're in Greenwich for Greenwich Capital, that totally makes sense. Um, and, you know, it, <clears throat> it also is emblematic of, well, Greg, okay, so the markets are driven by fear and greed. People always say that all the time, but is it really that bad? Yeah, it really is. I mean, I think what Susan experienced was people whose lives were at stake in their careers and their fortunes and their business activities. When the markets dropped like that, they were, as she's describing, going crazy. And the hard, the hard ground is that hardness of finances, that hardness of greed, that hardness of having a hard heart when you're focused on money. And we have a, we have a country, and the Western countries are countries that do uh, trust in and focus on money. Uh, money is a paramount issue in our, in our nations. And this is, this, is, uh, this is part of this symbolism and um, what's emblematic. Um, <clears throat> Anybody else like to share? I have one other story that's related to all this. Uh, we went down as a team here in Connecticut to repent at the nation's capital for the nation's sin, and all 50 states were represented there. That was part of the Heartland Apostolic Prayer Network and a guy named John Benefield. And the process was, that, was known as divorcing bail, which, which is another way of saying divorcing anything that isn't of God or false worship. And where we have entered into these um, false packs, these, uh, these wicked packs with uh, Baal or uh, any kind of pagan deity or you know, uh, worshiping an idol. And when you worship money or you follow money and you really, and it is the priority, that's what it is. It's like an idolatry. We don't call it Baal. We don't call it mammon. We don't call it these old names but nonetheless it's still it's still a real thing so on that trip a storm came through 
a storm that was very intense. It was a springtime nor'easter. It was coming up the coast. And if, for those who remember, it was actually an unnamed storm. But this happened early, I think it was in 2010, early 2010. Um, it could have been 2009, but I think it was 2010. And what was interesting was it had, there were soaking rains that had rained and it rained and it rained. And then the wind started blowing and all the trees got uprooted. All the trees, like the, the roots were loose and the trees got uprooted and they, they toppled over. And what was really interesting about that storm is as I was driving to our offices at that time, the firehouse to pick up other people to go on to DC to obey what the Lord was asking us to do to pray and intercede for Connecticut and for the nation. Uh, I could not get to our offices very easily, which is normally like a five to 10 minute uh, drive. It was like a half an hour, 40 minute drive because all the roads were closed wherever the trees had fallen and all the electricity was out from having all the trees fallen. And I remember the Lord speaking to me about this and saying something like, um, Greg, I'm uprooting the money tree. And I was like, you're uprooting the money tree. What does that mean, Lord? <clears throat> so this is post-financial crisis. Um, and I felt like that God was saying, like, the, the, the systems of man that have been created around money and to worship money, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to uproot them. Um, and I took it as here in our land, but probably it's beyond that too. And so I sort of tucked that in my heart. We went and we, we went down to DC and we had, you know, we went through these prayers and prayers of repentance and it was very good. Um, but later I met another person who came to a Christmas United for Israel event at our church who happened to live in our town here in Wilton. And she was sharing with me that when that storm came, the very same storm, and she shared this like two, maybe two months later or something. Um, and she said, you know, I had this experience and I didn't tell her any of what I just shared. She said, I had this experience during that storm and I was driving down the Merritt Parkway and all these trees were across the Merritt Parkway. So we were blocked. We couldn't continue. I pulled over and I started praying and she said, the Lord told me that this storm meant prophetically that I am uprooting the men of money. And I was like, you heard the hat? I, and I shared with her what I just shared with you. I'm uprooting the money tree. This is almost identical imagery. How could you make this stuff up? This is no coincidence. And um, what's very interesting is I did an analysis of the towns where the greatest power outage percentage wise and duration wise took place. And literally it followed the wealth of the Connecticut towns. So Greenwich was the hardest hit. There was like 90% power outage and they were out for a very long time. And then you go down and it was like the next hardest hit ones were New Canaan, Darien, Westport. It literally followed if you did a wealth demographic of uh, uh, net worth, of income, average income, it followed right down the ladder of the, these power outages. Now, power outage represents what? It's like, well, you lose your power. And if God is saying that he's uprooting the money tree and the men of money and is going to judge the, this, these structures, what is going to happen is there's going to be a power outage. That what was used to be leaned upon or used, like Israel would try to lean upon or use Egypt, um, now it's going to fail. It's not going to be there. There's going to be a power outage. And so all of that experience, I think, again, just reinforces the same kind of idea, which is God is saying, I'm judging these systems. Uh, they're going to be made low and humble and I'm doing it in waves. And it's the, the waves are a time where the people of God who can gain understanding can prepare for this exercise their faith, train in how to trust God instead of money, and then also create this alternative practically of helping uh, a network of cities and regions, helping one another, sharing biblically and using biblical concepts for banking and for investing that are outside of the banking system and the financial markets. 
So <clears throat> that's, a, that's a little bit more of uh, the story and testimony of like, what is the Lord saying? And why is he using this analogy? And what does this mean? And what is the hardness of that ground and Greenwich capital and, you know, what Susan experienced and what we experienced and Greenwich was the number one town in that list of towns in Connecticut affected by that storm. So um, anyone else want to share or contribute? Go ahead, unmute, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Yeah. yeah. Um, interesting. 2008, the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, Greg, I'm sure you remember this. On the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the market fell 777 points. And this was the beginning, I believe, of you know the, the, the financial shaking that was most probably the biggest since you know the 20s in the you know in the 20th century. And um, interesting you know look at three sevens you know you you find three sevens in revelation five uh chapter five when um the lord is the only one that is worthy to open the seals it talks about the seven eyes and the seven horns uh, the seven spirits uh and i think seven seals there are three of them in there um and uh, for me, this was, uh, this was um, you know, a wake-up call for me. It was a real turning point um, in my life. I actually wrote about it in the Ezekiel generation. Um, and interesting, it was also a Shemitah year that that happened. Um, and interesting enough, this was the, the, the time that Jonathan... Khan became really, really well known. And I think that's notable also because this is, you know, a, a, a Jewish voice beginning to, the, the Lord beginning to proclaim prophetically through the messianic side of the family. This was, a, I think, something, you know, strategically the beginning of something that we're, you know, obviously on this journey now. And for me, it was a, a major wake-up call, um, but it wasn't until 2014, I think it was 2013 or 14, that Greg and I had a, a super breakfast at a hotel in Westchester. <laughs> and uh, he shared this message with me, and I personally came under conviction. Like Greg, I was in the world, you know, uh, I was a successful businessman, I had run a number of businesses and you know like greg i was like you know uh you know an honest businessman but you know uh, uh doing all the things that business people did you know without thinking that some of these influences were you know coming from the wrong place and uh, obviously you know using my using the money and the wealth the lord gave to me to you know to prosper the kingdom and I know Greg you know that was major on Greg's heart as well so you know um the point I think I'm I, I'm getting a sense from the spirit to me is you know I think we're we're all on a journey you know I, we're all on a journey with this message I, I I know that also about the restoration in the one you man we're all on a journey and and the revelation is continuing to unfold. You know, my, I think my question is, Greg, you know, this is such a significant message for the church to have to hear and have an opportunity to repent from and to come into repentance. I just like to ask the question, like, what are the, what are the what are the what what kind of plans are you thinking about you know to really to to uh to you know to really proclaim this message at the threshold of the church kind of similar to what we're doing with the reconnection message to give people opportunity to even be aware of this because there's 
obviously such blindness, you know, most people don't even, you know, think that anything's wrong. Um, and so I just, uh, um, I, there's such a need at this point for this message to be trumpeted on a wider scale. Like, um, what, what, what are your thoughts and plans as far as that's concerned? Amen. So great sharing of our, of your journey, Grant. I'll never forget that breakfast. It was pretty amazing. And how God brought us together, even uh, through a dream about the one new man. And connecting that message with this message, with all the messages that God is speaking about of the great reformation he's calling the church into at this time. Um, there is a great repentance that's necessary and we can't give lip service to it. We have to, we have to demonstrate it with our actions. Uh, as it were the phrase, put your money where your mouth is. So we need to assess where is our money? Where is our heart? Jesus warned us, like, if you build up treasure on the earth, there your heart will be. So we need to understand that. Now, America is a very wealthy nation. Many Christians are wealthy. Many Christians have money in the financial markets. Uh, if not a majority. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, okay, if some of these things are coming under judgment because that wealth was gained improperly or with attached to it, the sin that's involved, um, and it's related to people's greed and fears, uh, what do we do about it? <clears throat> well, one is getting the message out as Grant is talking about. How are we doing that? Well, a big part of this is people have to catch a revelation of the message. One of the reasons we're using metaphors like Egypt is because that's how God helped me understand this, was using biblical analogy. That's how he helped Jonathan Kahn understand it, is he gave him these downloads of biblical analogy to the United States today, and, and so forth. So we need to be, and this group is really a discipleship group, a networking group, to get this word out. Who else needs to hear this message? Now we are building up resources on newbreed.co and in YouTube and other places and channels. We have writings, we have presentations. Uh, we're developing a book, but all these things are available now. What, just to share with you guys, like practically what I felt the Lord was doing and saying was write I think it was the, it was right around May of 2020. I got a, a dream that I felt where God was saying, I'm going to bring you into a place where you are to everything that I've shown you. And I've taught you, I want you to speak that word. I want you to preach that word. I want you to help instruct the body of Christ. I'm going to give you venues, opportunities, connections where this message can go forth. And I was thinking kind of in my old way of thinking that this meant I was going to be on the road traveling from city to city to city giving talks. But instead what's happened is God is doing it virtually over Zoom during the pandemic, having those talks here, there, and everywhere and they're all being recorded and put down so that other people can watch these things later. So that is a big part of getting this word out is as we have this discussion, others can come in later and, and listen. And it's just like, why do you have a podcast? So you can listen and understand when you got more time to reflect and this message can get out. I feel like that that's what the Lord is doing and saying is he's using these new technologies to get the word out. And then to build the network of people that will further get the word out. And you really can't get the word out effectively, I feel, and this is part of the strategy, without having prototypes and demonstrable um, efforts towards the vision of what God is saying to do as the alternative. That's why the message of repentance and reformation and coming out of Babylon or Egypt has to be associated with the storehouse vision, because the storehouse vision is, well, everyone asks, well, Greg, what's the alternative? Like, if you don't think investing in the markets is wise, well, what do I invest in? And that's where God is speaking to us that don't think of your money 
as just a tool to be generous. Think of your money as belonging to God. And even in your investment side, even in your saving side, you can use that, deploy it, share it with the body of Christ, not just for a gift, but for an investment. And that's the whole strategy of the storehouse is like networking the people of God together. We've outsourced so many things to the rest of the world, have we not? Has the church not outsourced its media, uh, its, its business, its, its even governance at times? Like we've outsourced so much and God is saying now, lead by example and take back those things which you've just trusted in and depended on Egypt, let's say, as we're talking about today. You don't have to do that. You can gather together and instead of having people go to Egypt to get their provision, People can plant right in the, you know, a place of God, the promised land of God, just like Isaac did in the time of famine. And we can support one another, love one another, invest in one another, share with one another. And we, we have to start demonstrating that. So part of that demonstration is the New England storehouse where we're modeling this in the kneecap, as some of the people on the call have been participating in the kneecap. It's not terribly complicated. It's just a matter of saying, you know, if somebody needs help or a loan or is uh, starting a new business and it's something for the Lord, instead of outsourcing it and sending them to Wall Street or sending them to a bank, let's see if we can bring some resources together amongst the people of God and be the bank for them. Uh, we've done that to consolidate debts, to get people out of debt. Uh, God wants us to get out of debt. Debt is a part of slavery analogous to when God's people were enslaved in Egypt. Debt is in slaves. That's a biblical truth. And so the biblical lending model gets us out of that type of slavery where the slavery is, okay, if we, if we are, have an agreement, a, a debt covenant with a financial institution, there's no connection in God in that. There's no personal relationship anymore in that. Even if we had a personal relationship with the salesman who is a Christian, on the back end, when it's serviced or we have trouble and we can't pay our bill, there's no one who will help us there. Now, that's part of this Egyptian mindset of, of why these systems are wicked and evil. There's nobody home to help anybody. So let's get people out of those structures and into how God can supply his own people. And we could, there's, nothing, there's nothing that prevents us from doing that. So it's getting the message out, it's communicating it. We all are the ambassadors, right? We are discipling ourselves under the feet of the Lord, just as we prayed earlier today. Teach us, Jesus, how to do this. Teach us how to get this message out. And we as ambassadors spread this word. Hey, you know what? One of the th we, we, we often as church focus on abortion and sexual immorality. We got to focus on greed too. We got to focus on fear and greed. We've got to focus on that. That's a thing that God is speaking to the churches. You've got to come out of that. So we don't want to be hypocritical. Oh, these are the sins of the world, but I have my own secret hidden sins or sins I didn't even know about. We need to get the word out so that people can repent and we can move into this alternative way of doing things according to God's word. And so that's a bit of a response grant to like, how, how is God going to do this? He spoke of it as being a two-year period. And what's really great is we're starting to get more and more traction on these videos and these messages, more hits, more people pulling down the content, more connections. And I think it's poised technologically to be able to multiply and grow, whereby um, we would never be able to do that sort of in the old uh, method of traveling everywhere. It's gonna, I think it, it's positioned to, to travel even greater in this in this new format. Joel, go ahead or Grant. Does that make sense? Yeah, I and and I'd still like to pray, Greg, this year for and and I understand like, you know, I, I totally get, you know, where you're coming from and what you're doing. But let's pray for some larger church platforms to give you 
a mantle to, you know, to give you a place where you can proclaim this message. Um, and it can begin also to get into wider circles. I, I really think we should pray into that. Absolutely. And we, I'd also say on the, um, what God is asking us to pray into is to raise up people as part of this movement to build support and uh, structure and infrastructure and, uh, and to, in, in order to help get that word, get the word out because a lot is needed. We need to do video, audio, uh, stuff, written things, visual things. Um, there's, there's so much work to be done. So we need an, almost an army of God to be raised up to support the message and the word. It's really not about me per se. Um, it's, it's really about what the Lord wants to speak to his churches. And so wherever we can become that message, we want to do that. Um, but yes, let's pray for that. And in fact, you know, we just got off of a, a church platform in, um, Florida. Many of you guys like watch the uh, Manatee County summit down in West central Florida. And for years, uh, God has been bringing me down there to speak and join together with their efforts uh, in unity across these uh, Florida cities. And so they have been drinking in this word. They have been uh, understanding it. And so more cities and, and, and pl as you're saying, church platforms who can respond like this. And really the thing is to crack people's hearts to say, hey, we really need this. We really need to understand this. There's something here that we need to understand. So it's just about getting people's um, hearts engaged. Joel, did you want to share? You had your hand up. Yeah, um, I just dropped two links. Um, I wanted to add two thoughts on the kind of the 400 year thread and it's how America and Egypt dealt with labor and um, slavery was used in both cases like real physical slavery and i just pulled a link because i have always associated slavery with the south uh, but somebody had mentioned recently that there's slavery in the northeast as well and specifically massachusetts so i had to fact check it found a link that the first slaves did arrive in massachusetts in 1638 um so um you know 20 years after uh, the initial landing. And it talked about, there's a letter from John Winthrop's brother-in-law, who was um, a lawyer, a London lawyer. And he was talking about how he could, saw the slave situation potentially planning out. And there was a war with the Native Americans, the Pequots, and they lost, the Native Americans lost. And they didn't end up being good slaves because they were free men and like, whatever. Um, and so, but they made up good human capital. And so there was this exchange where they were sent to the, uh, where is it in the, they were sent to the Indies, sorry, looking for it, in exchange for black Africans. Um, and so they came up and it's not as prevalent in Massachusetts in narrative because the agriculture just didn't, wasn't conducive for plantation agriculture, but it was conducive for two Af like native or um, black Africans to be working in a household to help with the trade of that household. Um, and so that was just an interesting data point for me as we look at what slavery is economically, you've called out accurately that there was a debt commitment that drove the Puritans to look for economic means to pay that back. And I'm looking at this link and I'm saying, well, their fastest way of gaining capital was actually war with the Native Americans or they being held loosely. I'm not exactly sure who the key players were in that you know, battle with the Native Americans, but capital was made in Massachusetts by way of this. Um, and then that rippled along and, and wealth probably rippled along as well. Um, and so that I think I wanna pull it forward into today. Sorry, um, 
what is how are we thinking about labor as we're looking at new ways of creating wealth, new ways of creating an economy today? Um, and I think we're on a good track in terms of um, like labor training. So the skill training that we've been talking about with some of the other conversations um, and training people that don't have good skills. Um, so that's that's the labor. And then plagues is simply um, the Egyptians couldn't handle nature and we can't either with COVID. And so I think it's God's gracious thing of showing in our pride, we're creating wealth in some spots, but we can't contain nature. And that's the humbling moment for us and all of that. Yeah, that's good. Um, and thanks, Joel, for bringing up the other seeds of leaven that were planted from the early days in America and slavery, chattel slavery, the Atlantic slave trade was definitely a part of that. What was the motivation? Money, greed, economic prosperity, and even the reluctancy of giving that up was all related to plantation wealth creation. It was related to profitability of the crops. Oh, if we don't have the slaves, we won't be able to make money in these crops. We won't be able to provide food. All sorts of arguments were thrown up, even biblical arguments like, oh, you know, we can have slavery because God said it, you know, it's okay here and there. So uh, all sorts of rationalization took place. But yeah, early days, um, what's interesting is like the Native American issue, big problem, big issue. But in early days, it started off well. The pilgrims had a great peace treaty with Chief Massasoit, who was a chief of chiefs all around the Massachusetts Bay Area. And that was an amazing example of how to work together with people. Um, that fell apart quickly. Then there were the Pequot Wars and all these other atrocities, broken treaties, all sorts of troubles. But it starts small and it keeps growing. It started small in Egypt too when the people of God were being taken care of Goshen and then they more and more got enslaved. Through what? Through the sins of men. And so that's these things are things we've got to repent of, understand, chattel slavery, not right. The broken treaties with the Native Americans, wicked in God's sight, um, mistreatment of others, and Joel's now bringing up labor. When, you know, when we have companies that are so driven to profitability that a person just becomes a number, up, oh, we need to reduce staff. Like we've got, we've got trouble ahead, got to contain costs. Are we really caring about those people's lives, what they're going to do next? That's a great question to ask ourselves. Are we treating our employees well right now? We may be, we may not be. But what we know is that these structures that are getting worse and worse, these Egyptian structures of governance of companies, um, public shareholders and publicly traded companies that have to answer to shareholders in the name of profit only, really, if you really understand it, um, that creates all sorts of opportunity for sin to creep in and trouble to come. So the whole taking back idea uh, for the church to lead by example is, hey, you know what? We don't have to all be invested in publicly traded companies. We don't have to put all of our wealth in those baskets. We can use our wealth in good, healthy ways. Like we can incubate and develop godly businesses that honor God, honor people, honor our uh, the, our, our, our workers, honor our suppliers, our vendors, our customers. How? Well, let's model it like Boaz acted in the Bible instead of like Pharaoh acted in the Bible. And I think that's kind of the, the idea here. Thank you for that. I'm going to go over to Rafiq. Rafiq, you've had your hand up. Go right ahead. Yes, yes, yes. This is Rafiq. Uh, thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, um, before I jump into shower, I, I just a question popped into my mind. Um, I, I should have asked this question about 15 minutes ago, but I will ask it anyway. Someone brought up this number, 777. Yes. Uh, now, I recall in the 2008 um, meltdown, the uh, uh, S&P 500 uh, ended at number 666. Uh, and now it has quadrupled. And I have always wondered about that. So I would like to hear some comments about that because number 666 is seen negatively by many Christians. 
Uh, I'm not superstitious about it, you know, but it is seen negatively by many Christians. So, so that is my question. What do we make of that number? And now it is quadrupled. Amen. So I'm going to take a crack at it and then others can weigh in. Um, so Grant was bringing up how the Dow Jones Industrial Average, 30 stocks, dropped as an index um, by 777 points on Rosh Hashanah 2008, uh, which I forget the Hebraic number of the year. But Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the year of the Jewish calendar or the Hebraic calendar. Um, and so that represents biblically, just as 666 represents what biblically? The number of man, the Antichrist, which is like Babylon, which is like Egypt. So Antichrist, the number of man, 666. Often in the Bible, when numbers are tripled, it is a personification of that meaning. So when in the sixth day of creation, man was created, the number six comes biblically from that. It's the number of man. But when it's 666 together, it's basically pure man, not God. That's the Antichrist uh, mark. That's called the mark of the beast biblically. Now, 777 biblically is Jesus, the perfection, the seven completion, the number seven, even in Genesis 1, represented the seven days of creation. So seven is the number of completion. It's also known as the number of perfection. And when it's personified, it's personified in one person, the only person who lived without sin, who, is, who died for us. That's Jesus. So 777 is the personification of perfection and completion, and that's Jesus. And Grant was hinting at it's in the revelation of the judgments. Well, Jesus said that he was going to come back to what? To judge the whole earth and establish his rule and reign of the kingdom of God onto the earth. So that I believe is related to the this mark when the when the when the markets dropped like that, it was a sign of Jesus's judgment. I believe. I think that's that's like a legitimate interpretation. Now the S and P being six 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 could represent the opposite, which is that is what's being judged. This Egyptian mindset: the I am Pharaoh, I'm God, I I made the markets. We Americans like have you know created this and that and the other in our brilliance and our entrepreneurialism and our work ethic and et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's as best as I can offer uh, in terms of biblical meaning of those two number sets and why they might have been uh, shown up in the, in the, in the judgment or, or in the, in the financial crisis of 2008. Now it's quadrupled since then. What does that mean? I've looked at those same graphs Rafiq. And I've always been amazed, like, Lord, these troubles have been coming in waves, but the market seems to just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what does that mean? And we don't know. Like, this is a bit of the mystery of God, but, you know, the taller the giant is, the harder they fall. Um, you know, will these markets perpetually go up forever? That's what the market hopes. That's sort of when theorists of capital say, you know, the long-term uh, risk-adjusted uh, for the markets is a, this X percentage, eight, nine, 10%. So if we stay in the market long enough, it will always go higher. We'll always recoup, revert to the mean and recoup those returns. But the question is, is that true? And as the question is, this is leading up to a great crescendo where God is going to reveal himself and those who have trusted in it are going to have a hard fall. So uh, anybody else want to share what they sensed or, or know about to Rafiq's question? Wait. Nope. Go ahead, Rafiq. Yeah, no, I was just saying, you know, that this is a this is a negative number, is anti-Christ number. Yes. And uh, it prospered, uh, you know. So that was like, a, you know, as you said, it's a mystery. It's like, you know, it's, I was curious about that. Uh, as I said, I'm not superstitious, but you know, it is understood. It's a, it's a bad number. And it prospered. It, it, was it, it, it was not a warning. It was actually a number to jump in and make right. money. So you're, you're making the point. Well, and by the way, people do make this point. And in fact, back then, when I was sharing this word early days, people who were super bulls, strong bulls on Wall Street are those who want to see the market always go up. 
um, were like getting in my face with the same argument. This is the greatest opportunity to buy the dip. This system is great. This system is going to like go right back up again. And you know what? They were right. But does that mean that that's always going to be the case? And I, I think what we know right. biblically is that that will not always be right, that these things are not going to continue to exist into the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus will not run the economy and the banking and the financial markets in this fashion. There's no way. It's, it's, he would not be associated with the sin that's involved. So really, it's a question of, okay, what, when, what is the timing of all of this? And look at what Abraham prophesied. Sorry, God prophesied to Abraham, your descendants will be enslaved for 400 years. That's a long time. And it turned out to be true. Uh, in fact, I think by the time they crossed the Red Sea, if I'm getting it right, it was 430 years. So this can take a long time to incubate. Uh, there's another concept scripturally where Jesus said, the sins of, I think, the Canaanites are not yet full. But when they are full, that is when the people of God will move into the promised land, and I will judge those nations for their worship practices and sin, and I will drive them out, and I will even kill them all. Um, which seems like harsh and crazy, but that was God's sovereign choice. But it took a while for the, for the bowls of the sin to be filled before the judgment came fully. And so that's, that's another aspect to this, which is like to consider. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. I think that does, yeah, because, uh, you know, I mean, we read in the book of Judges and in the Old Testament and the minor prophets, that the Israelites continue to, continue to sin and continue to sin and continue to sin. And God was sending prophet after prophet after prophet, you know, and then eventually they were enslaved by the Assyrians and Egyptians and Babylonians and all that, you know, goes up to 586 BC. So I, yes, I think it does make sense, you know, that this maybe it's an incubating period. We don't know uh, what's going to happen. That's, in, that's God only knows. But yeah, I think uh, that was always a question in my mind. It does make sense. Hey, great. Another little tidbit and story is, as Grant was talking about, he remembered that moment, um, Rosh Hashanah. So does Jonathan Frizz, the founder of 10 Days of Prayer. For those of you who know Jonathan, um, he has a message that he's been given, a life message, where God showed him to call the church into repentance for 10 days during uh, beginning of Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, which are known as the days of awe biblically. It's a time where the Jewish people were led by God to repent, turn and self inspect themselves, get right before God before entering into the new year. And this is a, just, this is a repentance, a turning back to God concept. Anyway, um, he was shown this phrase. And when we met in 2010, my uh, prayer and asking God is, Lord, what are you saying about Egypt and Babylon and coming out of Babylon? What does this mean? What does this mean? And he, when we first met, he's like, oh yeah, well, when God was showing me this vision of what to do and, and, and this movement he was creating, he gave me a phrase. He said, Babylon refuses to mourn. And then Jonathan reflexively by the Holy Spirit said, but God's people will mourn before his return. So that's really interesting because it is, if you unpack that, it is literally the biblical journey of Jesus' second coming, but it's also the Revelation 18 content of Babylon refuses to mourn. These worldly ways and practices will not be repented of by the world. Babylon, this influence of uh, Satan's temptation, Will continue to corrupt the world it will continue to intoxicate the world it will continue to get the world drunk on these ideas of power prosperity fame fortune vanity sexual per pursuit immorality all of it the whole bundle of uh sinful practices of men and so babylon refuses to mourn babylon this structure of antichrist living without god will refuse to repent, will refuse to mourn, will refuse to bow the knee, even in the midst of her destruction, because destruction is 
is proclaimed by Jesus in the Bible there in many places of Babylon. Um, and, but God's people will mourn before my return. And so what does that mean? God's people will mourn. Well, part of mourning is like lamenting over the sin and the sinful practices of the world in Babylon. Part of the mourning will be to turn and repent and turn back to God. And so basically it's describing there's a process. If you look at Revelation 18 and you really dive into that process, the process is, hey, the God, there was a time for God's people to be enslaved in Babylon, but then there was a time for them to come out of Babylon and rebuild the temple. There, were, there is a time in the time to come, the time that we're in now. Babylon refuses to mourn, but my people will mourn before my return. That's in Revelation 18. It literally says that this, is, this condition of Babylon is getting worse and worse and worse. It's becoming a haunt for jackals and demons. That's code for demonic influence. Satan's ruling, Satan's influence and power. And God is commanding his people, you can no longer stay in that system. You must exit the system. You must exit the Babylonian influence. The whole world's leaders are corrupted by it. Uh, the whole economic system is corrupted by it. If you read 18, it's very much a description of global economy. So what God is saying is there was a time where it was uh, for the people of God that would be in Babylon, but then there's a time where God's people have to come out. And so we believe that this era, this is the time as we await the Lord's return and the preparation of the bride to be without spot or wrinkle, it's the time to exit out of Babylon. Why? Because if we don't, we're going to be complicit. We're going to be viewed as complicit by God in her sin. And we will receive of her plagues or judgment, which is where we don't want to be. So that's what Revelation 18.4 really gets into and describes is, hey, there was a time where we were in Babylon, God's people, but now there is a time where we're called out of that. Is this that time? And if you see it and believe it, that now is the time. We yeah. must extract ourselves from partnering with Babylon's sins or we'll be judged for them. And it's just as simple as that. And I think it's not hard to understand but what's hard to understand is like, is that really today? Is our economy like that? Is the world's economy like that? That's what everyone has to unpack and press into. And I encourage you to do that. Uh, Rafiq, you put your hand back up again. I know America. Yeah. Up, want to respond real quick. I, I just want to say, uh, God bless you all. I'm, I'm departing. I just got to get ready for work. So I just wanted to say bye to everyone. My, to my brothers and sisters. Bye. Thank you, Rafiq. Goodbye. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Love you, Rafiq. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Go ahead, Merrick. Thank you, Greg. This is a really in insightful meeting today. Uh, especially, I was excited about reading that you want to relate Babylon and Egypt and what's the difference, what's the similarity, what's going on in terms of the body of Christ in each case, and what's going on with the world system. It's um, it's a remarkable juxtaposition of um, seeing things, I'll just share a few ideas. Um, but I, I truly believe that we're in a period of judgment for the world system. Uh, America is responsible for exporting the capital markets around the world and for exporting the desire for mammon and greed and fear. And so we are largely responsible for the state of the world economic system. Um, but does it mean that as we, as some of us, as we have through repentance through the last several years, and your, your testimony, Greg, is very powerful. I, I have uh, a similar one. So I'm an evangelist for really um, coming out of Egypt and desiring to come into a place of storehouse, coming into a place of looking at things very differently. There's a group in, in, here in, in Keene called the Rise Up New Hampshire that we have lunch with every Wednesday. And so there's a fresh group of people who are really desiring to look at the nature of the state of the world. It's all upside down. We're, we all recognize how upside, how upside down it is. Education, government, economics, finance, small business trying to survive uh, through getting bank loans, et cetera, et cetera. So, but getting back to 
So they're, they're open to uh, really hearing uh, a different set of principles that really have come through um, Doug Jaden's book I came to give. Cooperation, building relational equity, stewardship, abundance, uh, sustainability. These kinds of things are just foreign to the world system because they're just not God. Um, the world system just has these, these idols and these uh, great uh, spiritual forces of strongholds of darkness over them, and God has to come to judge them. But does that mean he's going to judge us? I don't think so. I, don't, I think the body of Christ is in a place of needing, obviously, to come out, and God is going to make that a, very apparent during the time when he's going to judge the, the world system. So, but we're ahead of that curve. We know where we are. We know where we're going. We see that this is where God wants to take us. So I think we're more in Egypt than we are in Babylon. My sense is that, um, you know, the body of Christ is, is not um, totally contrary to what God wants to do. We want to repent. We need to repent. We recognize the error of our ways. We recognize that even, as you pointed out here in um, Ezekiel 29 through 32, the seven-fold uh, judgment of Egypt. If you read chapters 33 and 34, you find that God is then going into the watchman on the wall and say, you're watchman, if you don't speak the truth here and you don't get the people to be aware of where we're at in time, the blood is going to be on your head. And he goes into chapter 34, he talks about uh, judging the irresponsible shepherds and then bringing his own uh, uh, let's say, relationship back into the fold of what a true shepherd is and really prophesying Christ. So God's, God's always redemptive. The beauty of, of God's actions, he's always redemptive. And I think we don't have to fear this. We, we recognize that there are going to be some external shocks and some external judgments. And I think the economy is going to take some serious hits. But if, if our hearts are set on hearing the voice of God, waiting on God, being an evangelist for coming out of Egypt, being an evangelist for the storehouse, we're going to be uh, able to walk through this with a measure of freedom that yet we don't have, we've never experienced. I've never really experienced the freedom that's coming because we haven't had to deal with uh, the, re the actual system of the world being judged, but the reality of, of our hearts being conformed to the image and likeness of Christ, becoming more like him. So we have this, this great hope in us. And I think um, coming out of Egypt is more like what the body of Christ is going to do. And I think there's, there could be well some wealth transfer during this time. I think that's likely to happen because God wants to bless his people. He's not against us. He's for us. He's not bringing judgment on us. He's loving us. And so there's a, a real um, need to see the the Babylonian Revelation 18 coming out of that whole system as one part of it, but also coming out of Egypt as, a, as another part, which is the true remnant is in that place. And I think more and more people will be added to that remnant in time. So um, I think we're in a good place. I think it's going to be pretty challenging, but I, I believe that God wants to restore us, redeem us, and use us to shake this world with him in a loving, tender-hearted way, that kind of thing, I guess. Yeah, amen. I think that's that's a good word. God is not um, some penal, harsh God. That's a false image of the Father. Um, but nonetheless, we there's no if, if we hold on to a sin, we'll be judged yeah. for that sin. Um, meaning, yeah. we willfully defy God uh, when He's asking us to do certain things. And that's, that's the key. And I think the, all these analogies is we go too far. If we say the U S is Egypt, the U S is Babylon. The U S is this, the U S is that the U S is Israel. Well, it's not quite that. I just think that there are aspects of these mm -hmm. biblical nations and stories and people that mm -hmm. apply. And, um, you know, I think a great way of looking at uh, this perhaps this this distinguishing of Egypt versus Babylon, or this you know fine the fine difference maybe. Yeah. I like really what Jonathan Khan has done in terms of his uh, how he, God has revealed it to him because it fits right into what I feel like God is saying here. Um, and, and that is this: 
he he outlined in the harbinger not only was 9-11 a judgment strike against america a warning strike mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, where i felt for example that the lord was saying in those towers there was nothing of eternal value being developed it was all just temporal it was all in a sense meaningless uh, the eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper millions and millions that descended out of those buildings as people were losing their lives what's the point of that like what all the paperwork, all the pushing money around, like what's the point of that eternally? And so we, we, we see this in Jonathan Kahn's framework as a warning, just like Israel was warned. If you don't turn, if you don't repent, yeah. you're going yeah. to suffer the consequences. You're going to be judged. And that's real. Mm -hmm. um, and so what then he did was he had an analogy of this biblical character called Jehu. He was saying, and he basically put in his books, that President Donald Trump is like a Jehu. He was called Jehu to do what? To tear down Jezebel and to tear down Baal worship. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because have we not had all of those similar Baal worship items? Baal worship includes all the sins, the worship of self, the worship of sex, worship of pleasure, the worship of... Uh, Vanity, you know, it's all, it's all inclusive. Uh, but Jehu was a ruffian. He was uh, not necessarily like David, for example. He was a different character. And so that's interesting because like President Trump is a little bit of a Jehu. He's an alley fighter. He's, you know, he's, uh, <laughs> he, he, he's a wild man. It describes Jehu in the Bible. Um, he was not really controlled by anybody. And and by the way, he also wasn't perfectly adherent to God's word either. And so what he chose to do was he rightly tore down Jezebel, but he failed to tear down the other worship system, which was the golden calf worship system of the 10 tribes of Israel. That's very important because the analogy, if it holds, is like saying this, uh, President Trump honored Israel. He uh, appointed pro-life um, uh, Supreme Court nominees. These things are all great, just like Jehu was great in tearing down Jezebel. But what is the golden calf equivalent in our economy today? It is Wall Street. It is our modern economy. It's the things we're talking about. Yep. That is the thing that President Trump did not touch. He basically yep. fueled it even higher, even greater. Let's change the tax code. We will pump more money into the system with less corporate taxes. That'll return shareholders a greater profit. Stocks will go up. Everybody will think I'm great because the market's going up. So these ideas of we're great, I'm great, the markets are great, like that's very pharaoh like that's very self-centered like. And we have to sort of own that and say, are we the body of Christ a little bit too much like that? Are we a little bit too much in love yep. with those concepts of our yep. military might and prowess as America, our financial might and prowess as America, you know, is, is, is really the whole plan that America has to be great, or is it really the plan that the kingdom of God is great? And Jesus is coming yes. back. Mm -hmm. And this helps us understand this. This helps us understand, like, even though we can politically be against abortion, we can be politically against even sexual immorality. Um, which incidentally, President Trump was not against because he was not against like sexual immorality in, in, in a variety of dimensions. Um, but nonetheless, uh, but if we are against those things, but we are uh, responsible for, yet we're not repentant of the golden calf worship issues and we're tied into that, guess what? We are in a precarious position we must come out of those practices as well as the other practices and rightly align ourselves with Jesus. If we fail to do that and we still are warring against other people who are in the, let's call it Jezebel camp, um, like Jehu was, that's not a good place to be because it's a, yep. essentially that's hypocrisy. Yep. That's what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. Like, Hey, <clears throat> you know, you have a form of godliness here, but you still have sin of your own. So before you stone the adulterous woman who was in sin, yes, she was, but he who was out sin cast the first stone and people had to walk away from that because they realized like, wait a second, 
we have our own responsibility here. I think that's what God is really saying in this analogy. More repentance is needed. We can repent of the Jezebel issues and have done and even be righteous yep. there. But if we're like Jehu, and we keep worshiping yep. the golden calf over here. Big problem. And so interestingly, Chuck Pierce said during the elections of 2020, quote, we have a golden calf in New York City. Well, guess what? He's talking about the Wall Street and the financial markets. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Our entire economy is connected to the financial markets and our banking system. Um, and that is problematic if you can understand it. So God is calling his people to model this. Let's not be hypocritical. Let's come out of our own sin first, take out the plank out of our eye before we judge others of the speck. And in that way, we position ourselves not only not to be judged, but then also to be a faithful witness to the Lord, not a partial witness, which is religion. Religion is not what God is after. God is after a saving of people in their hearts. And that's, that's why I think why I like the Egypt juxtaposed upon Babylon is like we can even get a greater understanding of some of the problems we have in our nation, which then affects the other nations. Great, thank you. If I may just add a footnote to uh, that was really well said about Jehu and, and Trump and uh, Baal not being taken down in the markets. Uh, just again, zero interest rates are not in any economic textbook, but that's where we're at. <laughs> so I just want a footnote that we are in a Shemitah year this year. Oh, 2001, 2008 were both very serious negative hits. 2015 was not. 2020 was a hit because of the pandemic. That's another wave. Again, you alluded to many waves, Greg, and that's another wave of what God was doing. Yes. But this year is the seventh year, the seventh of seven. It's this, the 49th year, the seventh of seven Shemitahs in a Jubilee year, Jubilee year next year. So we're at a time frame where God typically has the... Uh, the flexibility, more flexibility to do something in context of his own plan, his own purpose. And so he does, Jonathan off, said oftentimes that God doesn't have to do anything in a Shemitah year, although he could. Uh, so it's completely up to him as to what part of that window he wants to enter into. But I think it's uh, significant that we're in a Shemitah year and the Jubilee's coming up. So I'm attending to that, and I'm not putting my hope and faith in that. I'm putting my hope and faith in Christ and what he's doing in my heart, what he's doing in the hearts of people I know and love, and just pressing into the to share it with the body of Christ and just to love people where they're at and hopefully bring a few more out of, of Egypt and Babylon and the whole process. Amen. And we always uh, need to have God's mercy and grace whenever we yeah. speak of judgment and associate yeah. things like as God's messengers, because he, he has hope and love and he's not a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, like some, you know, wife beating father. That's not who he is. So if you come I, out, if you come out, the redemptive process is just plainly evident in scripture. That's the main, main process that God has all of us in. Yep. It's, it's all redemptive. So it's, it, it's beautiful because it'll, it makes all things beautiful in this time. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hey, I wanted to turn this over to Sharice. Sharice, thank you for being patient. <laughs> I always appreciate what you have to say. Go ahead. Sharice, go ahead and unmute if you can. Okay, sorry. I'm getting ready for work and listening. <laughs> um, I actually had quite a question. Uh, and I probably am taking it back because my mind is going. It's probably good that I didn't get a chance to speak right away because I feel like the Holy Spirit is just talking to me. And it was during um, when Grant was talking and he was asking the questions about how to pray and how do we get the message out and at praying for more platforms within the church. And the thought that came to mind is that the message that you're carrying is not simply for the church, but to shift culture. And so I, I was like, oh, that's good, Lord, you know? Huh. And so I'm like, um, so I put my hand down because I'm like, okay, I need to think about this for a minute. And so 
I was like, okay, Lord, what do you what like what are you saying? And so as I'm getting ready for work and um I'm thinking about it more, you know what the Lord brought to mind, who he brought to mind in the scripture? Joseph, who was already positioned in Egypt. And if you think about it, while he was in captivity, while he was in prison, the Lord had given him dreams. And he interpreted and in those dreams, he interpreted his dream, which pushed pushed him and propelled him in a position um, to prepare. Uh, prepare for his family who actually came to Egypt and to prepare Egypt for the famine that was coming. So my question is, is this message, because I, I think what we do a lot of in the body of Christ is that we, we, we share um, the revelation of Christ and, and, and really it's the revelation of the kingdom and what God um what God is doing in the earth through the church with the church. Um, but we are here not to stay within the confines of the church, but to take over culture and to shift culture. So that's my question. Is the message you're carrying one? Because, it, and if you look at Joseph and I'm, I can't like, like I, I really have to sit down. I'll write you and email you. Cause I'm like actively talking to the Lord about it. Like, what are you saying? If you look at Joseph, and, and what Joseph did, um, I don't know, it, is this message simply for the church or is this message a message that the Lord intends to use as a model? Because we look at the world system, which is what you are always talking about for we and if we've used the world's system and the world system has impacted the church. I guess my thought is is it not time for the church to impact culture and shift culture? And, and the Lord, it, it, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. The scripture that just popped in my, in my mind was the scripture that talks of, about the kingdoms of, the, of this world becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So I don't know. That's just my question this morning. Is, is this specifically for the church or should, is this message, should it be a message that should be shifting culture? Okay. Amen. What a great question. Sharice, you're on to it. Though we spend a lot of time within the church and church circles, and that's valid because we have to be discipled in this and repent ourselves if we're going to even be hoped to be used by God to shift culture. Absolutely. The end game is not within the church. It is to evangelize the fullness of the gospel of the kingdom. So the gospel is not just the gospel of salvation, it's the gospel of the kingdom. This message does have to get out into the world. This does have to get out to Wall Street. This does get, have to get out into government. This does have to get out into culture. So whereby we're bringing a package of the kingdom of God rather than just, hey, believe on Jesus and you'll go to heaven. What Jesus actually commanded us to do is to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And the kingdom includes this economic components. This kingdom includes all the things we talk about. So the reformation is all for a purpose, the purpose of winning people over. And, what, and one of the things I share oftentimes with people is like, when we deal with cities that are, that are struggling, I've worked together many times in the North End of Hartford with a lot of the pastors in, that, in those neighborhoods. And Bishop Marshall Mons in one of our evangelistic initiatives and gatherings for Louis Palau and his, his, his association was, you know, we will do the evangelism thing. We will go out and we will preach the, 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 the message of Jesus. Um, and, but you know what? It's going to, a lot of it's going to fall on deaf ears because people always come to me saying, pastor, I need a job. And when he said that, it just struck me right between the eyes. Because if the church is unrepentant in these areas and we're just like the world, how are we creating jobs? How are we creating an economy that God can truly bless and increase? That's what he's trying to do. So yes and amen, we have to have an economic component to what we preach that is necessarily different than what is being judged. And thank you for sharing that. That is awesome. And let's pray for those opportunities as well. Grant, go ahead. Or Sharice, if you want to say anything more, just let me know. Can you hear me, Greg? Yes. Can you hear me? 
We can hear you. Okay. Um, um, I think we should double check um, the Jubilee year. I, I thought uh, the Jubilee was 2017 when we had that meeting, Greg, in, uh, in Greenwich. And the Lord had us blow those three prophetic shofars. And we had rainbows around both years, if you remember that. I do. And uh, that's, when, that's when you saw the fireball as well. So I just want to double check. I, I, you know, let's just double check and make sure, you know, I thought it was 2017 when Trump declared uh, Jerusalem to be the capital. Um, uh, uh, just another footnote. Um, yeah, I love Sharice's question. But a footnote on, um, you know, on Egypt and Babylon. Could it be that Egypt is the worldly system and Babylon are the influences? That's kind of what hit my spirit as I was, you know, as we've been trying to, I think the Lord is wanting us to drill down on this to get a better understanding, you know, of, um, of this this morning. So I just wanted to comment on that, Frank. Great. Hey, a couple things like, yes, Merrick mentioned that. I did not um, want to argue or disagree, but you, sure, we need to look into like, well, what is the proper Jubilee year? People have different interpretations of that. They go into the old Hebrew calendars and they say, this is the year, that's the year. It started here. And so without getting into all of that, like we don't really know, and we can just press in and ask God, perhaps empirically what that jubilee year is from the old days like if we started the calendar back uh 3000 years ago or whatever it should have been um but yes to your point that's another uh prism uh view of this is could egypt represent the systems that are corrupted in babylon the influences maybe maybe that's another thing we can take a look at and pray into um yeah, so Sharice uh, is saying she's got to go. Thank you, Sharice. Good to be with you, and thank you for your inspiration and work. Stacy, go ahead. Um, I had something just before we started uh, the call. I had something similar to what Sharice um, was getting, and I had um, I was reminded of the shekel um, that was pulled from the mouth mouth of the fish and um to remember the verses um around that and so that is matthew um 17 25 is where i'm going to start and or actually 24. so when they had come to capernaum those who received the temple tax came to peter and said does your teacher not pay the temple tax and he said yes and when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from strangers? And Peter said to him, from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Um, and then he says, nevertheless, go, you know, grab this, these shekels, um, one, you know, to pay for you and one to pay for me. But what the what I was getting at was the um, okay. So then you put that together with that we um, the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, we are to understand our authority and move in our authority as the um, the bride of Christ, as the sons and daughters of um, God, and. Um, understand how to rule and reign in that authority. When Joseph was in Egypt and he was operating, I got the word operating, when he was operating in Egypt, um, there was a presence of God there. And so if you put those two together, then you've got the sons are free. Um, Jesus said to him, the sons are free you know he's using example worldly king rome governing do, do you think the king is taxing his sons 
Are they the ones that pay it or the strangers? Um, and, P and Simon spoke correctly. He said, well, it's the strangers who pay it. And, and Jesus said, well, the, the sons are free. Um, so if you're operating, if the kingdom of God at hand and the whole universe is standing on tiptoes to in anticipation uh, of the revealing of the glory of the sons and daughters of God, and then we're free and we're operating in the kingdom and just like Joseph, when he was operating in Egypt, um, the presence of God was there and um, there was a, blessed, uh, a blessing upon the people who were the sons of God. So that's kind of what I was getting. And yes, the, um, in Jonathan Kahn's book, he starts his jubilees um, for the nation of Israel with um, 1867, 1917, 1967, 2017. And they always go like that. They go on the 67 and on the 17. Um, but Jonathan Kahn did say, We're, um, I'm going to discuss a jubilee of a different kind. And he discussed one of, um, I believe, 1948 which was um, based around Truman. Um, and then he equated it to uh, a 70 year period with, um, that came up to 2017. He called 2017 a double jubilee because of that, because of that governmental uh, jubilee that he pointed. And I don't know, you know, is that free license to, like you were saying, when do you pick these jubilees? very clear that Israel's jubilees were on the 67 and the 17. Um, so anyway, um, I've also read his Shemitah book and the Oracle. So that's where I get that from. So that's my share. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Stacy. And um, a great point about the coin and the fish's mouth uh, for us too. That analogy is not only the authority of Jesus and the sons and daughter of Jesus, but also the miraculous provision of that coin. So though it was right and proper for the sons and daughters to be free, Jesus said, nonetheless, to prevent offense, we will pay, and here's how we will pay. So when we have a bill or we have a need or we have a uh, need to pay a tax or what have you, God can always make a provision supernaturally for the sons and daughters such that it's taken care of if we follow him, trust him, and worship him. And that helps us get out of a mindset of we always have to have a dollar, an income, a savings or investment to provide for everything. God can do things in extraordinary ways. We need to rediscover that inheritance. And also, Stacy, thank you for clarifying why the jubilees are typically looked at in that pattern. And I, and I forgot about that, that, that alignment with the history of Israel. 67 was the, uh, was the war that recaptured Jerusalem, the six day war. Um, and, and I think uh, it, it, the earlier one than that, there was another uh, aspect where in the jubilee, I believe someone in Great Britain, a leader declared it was the Balfour Declaration declared the lands of Israel for the people of God, for, for, for uh, Jewish people, something like that. Maybe Grant would remember. But yes, I think that was why those years were used. Uh, anyone else like to share? Um, Grant, if I could ju just jump in quickly. Um, this morning I was um, at um, a pre-meeting for, for uh, we were praying for government leaders and the Lord led me to Micah, uh, Micah 7 from verse f uh, 15. And um, it really parallels um, what your notes are. Um, I'll just read it from my Bible, which is the New King James. 
as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall put their hand over their mouth. Their ears uh, shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent and they shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and you shall fear because of you. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? So I'll just leave it at that. But to me, I felt the Lord was really highlighting as, as it was when he brought them out of Egypt. So it will be again where he is going to do such signs and wonders that the nations um, will see that no matter how mighty the might is, it is nothing compared to the might of the living God. So there are signs and wonders that are coming upon the earth that is going to silence every um, stronghold of self-importance uh, or self-preservation. Uh, or um, And then, of course, the... The reality is that God is doing this also because he's gathering his people. The Jewish people need to be home, which is going to have a huge uh, economical effect on everything. Because the Messiah is coming back to Jerusalem. So all the nations are going to be held accountable to the Lord. Uh, and that's a judgment of the nations of the world as to how they have treated his people. So that's another form of judgment, apart from we're talking financial. But uh, what happens with Israel is going to, is the climax of the age. And we know that the Lord says the wealth of the nations will flow into, into Israel. So. Israel does need to be in, um, you know, positioned rightly in our thinking. Um, America isn't Israel. Israel is Israel. <laughs> and the church is the church, yeah. Anyway, so thank you for letting me just jump in there. That's great. Grant, you want to respond? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, um, I don't know if, uh, if you're aware of a brother called Bill Koenig, uh, but he's written an amazing book on uh, the actions of American presidents related to Israel and a two-state solution. Um, and um, um, I forgot the name of the book, uh, but it was a great book that really tied in specific dates to whenever an American president looked once again to divide up the land to the humanistic concept of sort of dividing Israel, um, there was immediate judgment. You know, it happened to Bush and no one has yet spoken about Trump's declaration in January of 2020 when he, with the influences of his son-in-law, uh, Jared, who I, you know, who is a, a, a secular Jewish descent, you know, went again to that two-state solution, and immediately there was judgment, you know, with the way that the uh, virus uh, hit the country, um, and you know, Bush uh, at the end of Bush's term when he declared the two-state solution, we hit the financial crisis. And with Trump declaring a two-state solution, as much as he was loyal to Israel, you know, I think he made it. 
Hey, Grant, we're losing you. If you want to rewind like 20 seconds, are you still there? All right, we'll come back to Grant when he comes and back. I think to we're Austin. going to there hear go. in the with Herring a lot of this stuff, hey. and he has it all tied in. Grant, um, could you just rewind 30 seconds? We missed you there with your cell phone. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, Let's cool. Like yeah. So, yeah, no, I was just saying that I, I know Bill Koenig is working on a new document that really reinforces this and ties in some of these dates to when Trump made that decision to declare a two-state solution uh, with Israel and the Palestinians. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, um, I just wanted to just affirm what Antoinette was saying. Really important, right? So we can, like Antoinette's talking about, a president of the United States, currently the most powerful, arguably, nation in the world, could either be like a Cyrus, which is what Truman was described as, even as President Trump was described as, or could be like a Pharaoh. And when we divide the land, uh, we are acting like Pharaoh with sort of our, our own ideas of how to solve a peace issue. And so I think you're right on. So President Trump can be a Cyrus, but he could also be like a Pharaoh in that sense of if, Ultimately, the Abraham Accords were all about opening up a way of dividing the land. That's no good. And we don't want to go there ever. We're, any nation who does that is going to be divided according to the scripture. That's just scriptural truth. So, yes, um, another great scripture that um, the Micah scripture reminded me of, Antoinette, is the one out of Zechariah, which is 8.23. Zechariah 8 is where people are coming to the Jewish people, to believers, and grabbing hold and saying, hey, we need to go up with you. And 10 people, it says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, in those days, these are the days ahead, 10 people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. As we go into more and more shaking, when those shakings do not affect us or Israel, that's how people will know, we need to go up with you. By the way, that's exactly what happened in Egypt when the plagues came. The people of God were not touched in the latter plagues. And what was the response of the people of Egypt? Hey, we're happy to give you all of our gold and silver and treasure because God is with you. We're scared, rightly so, because the living God has sent these plagues. So I think this is this is all what's what's coming, and this is all this all makes sense. This all fits into uh, this pattern. America is not Israel. America is not Egypt. America is not this. America is God's creation, and is unique in the, in, in in many senses of the word. Um, but it can adopt these principles, these these characters of the bible uh, for good or for evil we can choose which one we want to who we want to serve uh, i've got two hands up here susan you've been waiting go ahead yeah i just wanted to share a picture that i got in the beginning when you were first initial praying and and opening us up and it was um it was a treasure chest and it was filled with all kinds of um jewels and treasures and things like that and there was a sun but i wrote s-o-n the sun was coming down and it was shining on it and it was giving a spotlight in the center. And then there were uh, cherub wings on either side and it looked like the mercy seat of God and the cherubim protecting both sides. And so I was just getting this picture and I, and I see why I had to share it at the end is because everybody's gifts and contributions and the treasure that is in this chest from what we've learned today and how people share and the, the, the cherubim wings of God, the mercy seat of God is on both sides of this treasure chest and protecting it. And the son of God, the shining light is coming through the center of those wings and shining down on this treasure chest. So I just wanted to share that picture with you guys. And I thank you, Lord, for 
the treasure of all of the people and their hearts, everything that they've given, Lord God, all the insight and wisdom that you have given each one, the revelations and the gift of teaching and the gift of prophecy and the gift of learning, Lord God. You've given it all today. And we just thank you for this treasure chest of love that is being presented to you, Lord God. We lay our crowns down at your feet, Lord God, and we give them back to you in this day so that you can multiply the loaves and the fishes. You can multiply this in your hands because it's your kingdom come, not our will be done. So we thank you, Lord, that we can give this back to you today. In Yeshua's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Outstanding prayer. That could even be our closing prayer, but... <laughs> Stacey has her hand up. Thank you for that. And we look as we that, that's why this format is structured the way it is. As a roundtable discussion, we each share a piece of what God is revealing. And then we see more and more of him and we can become more and more like him, each one contributing. And that's what's the beauty of uh, this coming together. Stacy, uh, we'll make your thought the parting thought. And uh, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, it's really quick. Okay, so for to Grant. Grant uh, said, well, you know, I haven't heard anybody mention the uh, 2020. So I did pray into it with Greg, either in his prayer call on Mondays or on this last time we, you know, when we last met on Wednesdays. But I prayed into that and I had opened the document or the news article that said, it was either January 26th or January 28th of 2020. Um, Trump and Netanyahu were in the White House together and they had their two, their division of Israel um, thing ready to sign. That was after the Abraham Accords. Those were more like in September of 2019, but somewhat connected to it. We prayed into it. Greg and I, Greg uh, added to the prayer. We prayed into it. Um, yeah, it was, and Netanyahu had been warned two times previously by prophets not to divide uh, Jerusalem and um, not to have the two um, state thing. And, but he did it and he, he did it again and he'd lost power the previous time. He did it again with Trump and then coronavirus uh, hit, um, you know, the United States within a couple of days after that, or that day even, um, if it was January 28th, 2020. And um, so we did, Greg and I have prayed into that um, together. Uh, and then also, oh, oh, okay, one more thing for Grant and everybody, I guess. Okay, so not this, so last Friday, so just this past Friday, Barry Wunsch was on Elijah stream and he shared a word specifically on this. He shared, it's, 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 a, it's heavy. It's, um, and it says the word Jared uh, Kushner in it. And it says he can't get his hands clean. Things are becoming revealed about uh, him and his involvement. And he was definitely involved in that two-state solution and I, I recommend listening to that because uh, it really um, shed some more light on what Grant was you know asking have we spoken about it and have we prayed about it so anyway uh, that's what I wanted to share hey that's great and we will uh, stop there one little quick tidbit around all of that is if we ever wonder well why didn't President Trump get a second term one of the factors could be if he had a second term, some of these accords might have gone through. That would be way worse uh, for us as a nation and for Israel. So just something to food for thought. Um, hey, bless you guys. And Lord, we thank you for this time. And we give you all the glory. May people listen to this and be inspired. Holy Spirit, speak. Word of God, speak to each one and enrich them with those treasures out of this chest of wisdom in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Great discussion. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for um, uh, being the new breed of business. Bye for now. Bye -bye. Uh, Gregory.